the tree falls. But did it go as planned? We watched it, but did we learn how to do it? Why is he doing that? Why is he dressed so weird? You can't wear all of that and work. I've heard those statements many times. If you've had that experience, you would know. What is he doing? Checking how tall a tree is? What difference does that make? I want to measure make? height. I take Why? stick a slightly That's longer stupid. than my arm. I point it at the you base. You don't have time to do all that. And I rotate the stick up. And I walk back or forward until the top of the tree. That's leverage is when you go up. But based on what I said earlier, if I look at this tree and I go to the outer... Have you ever hit tree something tree? with a tree? Hung into another one? Broke off a limb? If you've had that experience, you'll know why it's important to height measure. How much lean this tree has. So Tyler, take the side lean information on this tree from my target, which is in front of my stick, and tell me to either move out or, or move back this way when I get to where the lean is. It, it may not look like much, but it's gonna be somewhere around four to five feet. So this is my good side. So from my good side, at 90 degrees, I'm gonna determine whether the tree has back lean or forward lean. And based on the outermost limb to the front, outermost limb to the back, it looks like the tree does not have any discernible lean forward or back. So I have to treat it as a back leaner in that case. <laughs> So if I want the center weighted mass of this tree to go on top, what is all that? I'm gonna need to if you've had the experience, you know. How do you check tree leans? What positions do you place yourself in to check? There are side leans, think of that and, remember it. and there well, are forward to back lean. lean that way, Does watching way it being cut, down, watching it fall, create experience without side. knowledge of the this plan? I want to escape Can a bad experience produce more bad experiences? Which is 16 feet or more. Watching the bad ones or planning for the good ones? Experience? I'm going to use my failing sight. I'm going to go to my target. But I'm going to How did you first learn of something? Foot in the other direction. I'm going to cut my notch, not getting more Most than Most everything we learn diameter. is from doing, sure from watching, from reading. At this point, I don't know that my saw will reach all the way through the base of this tree. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to come from the bad side first. I'm going to bore in behind the that apex produces of my notch. our experience. I'm set up a hinge that is uh, experience about two is the best teacher. This tree is probably deviated. But there are two tree. types of experience. It's about 24. It's about 24. Good inches. ones and okay. bad ones. So two feet. So I'm going to set up a hinge that's two inches. Let's look at how planting can make more good experience. How much easier is it to learn all with all, all the parts? Directional felling is to place the tree where we want it to go. And given the ability to limit its exposure, as well as ours. In other words, against a top of another tree or brushing something that might cause struck by situations. Struck bys are the most hazardous when it comes to injuries in the forest and under the trees. We can learn from our own experiences. If I but how long wedges, does that take? No problem. I put my saw down. But can that be faster or slower and more dangerous if we that? just watch so and don't have the plan? That is my five-step failing plan. Does that sound like a good plan? Did the results become a good experience or a bad one? We know a lot of information about this tree, a lot more than we did five minutes ago. 
that ends in our experience. So, I said I wanted a notch that was 70 degrees or more. That's pretty close to 70. When I cut that, I had a little bypass. I was a little higher on this cut than I was on my cut down. You can see from the front that I'm not 100% of the diameter of the tree. I'm about 80% of the diameter. I've got no bypass. I can come here, come around, come around this way. So get behind my saw, behind the felling site right there, directly behind it, and tell me where it's aimed. My target where that front stick is. Am I on it or am I on the left or am I on You're to the right? I'm, I'm several feet over in this direction, right? So that's what I try to do to compensate for its length. Once again, let's go back to what I said. Let's quantify success. Success is the tree out here and everybody's safe. If there was a house right here, then the margin for error has got to be more accurate. It's either an execution problem or a plan problem, right? So it goes back to, was the plan wrong or was the execution bad? I mean, we can see that where I was aimed, so I tried to aim over on that side. We've got a good consistent hinge that held. Oh, so I said I was going to have two inches. It's two and a half. It's two and a quarter there. So it's a little thicker. That's also one of the things I didn't talk about hinges. Super important to know in storm damage. The thicker the hinge, the slower the movement. So if I want a tree to move and it needs to pass canopies and things like that, I make sure that my hinge is a lot thinner because I need it to move faster. Let's take a tree like this that's horizontal and I put a notch in a hinge. The hinge thickness determines how slow I get it to move to the ground. And I want to be in control. When I said a, a notch in a hinge gives you control, storm damage by trying to get the weight to the ground, the thicker the hinge, the slower it moves to keep me from having to run back as I'm cutting. Okay. You can't stack them this way because if you're hitting the one, the one that you don't hit flies back out at you, right? So when you put one here as kind of a shim and then a wedge here and drive that one tight, then I can maximize the amount of movement that I can get here. So I get twice the lift. But as soon as I tap this one, it went. Did you see that? I mean, it was literally really close. And, and I wasn't looking up at the canopy. I was watching right here. As soon as that opened up, I grabbed my saw and I got easily at least 16 feet or more away in the skate route. And then and I wasn't watching to see where, because there's nothing I can do at that point. I've either done it properly or I haven't. The tree is down. I didn't do any damage really to other trees. I'm 100% I'm satisfied with that. And that's really the value of a notch and a hinge and how to take trees down with just, you know, a tool like a plastic wedge. And trees like this, you can do it smaller diameter. You can take trees that have side lean. You can take trees that have a lot of back lean. And you can take them down with this based on the calculations as long as you've, you know, got the, got the right information and the right tools.
power, the value in this is a notch and a hinge. A rope in a tree and a piece of equipment pulling does not negate having this. But if he's putting a ton of tension and pressure on a tree while I'm cutting, it's exposing me to a lot of danger. Most people think, oh, I can manhandle a tree with a big enough machine and a rope. Well, you're putting, a lot of, you're putting the sawyer in a lot of danger. A rope in a tree and a piece of equipment pulling does not negate having this. You don't have to put a lot of pressure on a tree. I can make all these cuts, set all this up, have that in there and release that. And once the tree is completely cut, I say, put tension on the rope and then they pull it over. That's no different than what this did in that case. But if he's putting a ton of tension and pressure on a tree while I'm cutting, it's exposing me to a lot of danger. Then all the machine is doing is actually doing what this did, just a lot easier. And I can still have this because ropes break. If they're pulling it and the rope breaks and I don't have this in there and it's a back liner, I'm not getting it in there, right? It may sit down and close, but one thing I'm not gonna do is push it up enough to get this in. Right? Matter of fact, you know, with small uh, diameter trees, there's techniques where you run the wedge through the front ape the apex of the knot to get maximum wedge movement, right? So trees can be hollow. This technique works great. It works great because you're not cutting 100% of the diameter. If you get 100% of the diameter, in that case, that's this right here. There's not much, I can't do much back here. There's a lot I can do up here. I can make adjustments to my <coughs> bypass if I have some, but there's a lot of things that, that I can do. It would have probably come out right there eventually which would have been okay in this case because then I could have saw could the curve the over there. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I know what you're, you know, you, you want to get at. So if you look at this, these cuts pretty much match up. Right? That's part of the learning when you do this enough. If I come in here and I cut this wood fiber and I cut these bypass, the tree is cut. The wood fibers, fibers are severed. For the sake of just matching, you can see what I did right here was kind of lower and I started cutting back up to this. Once I saw this kerf over here, I started making an adjustment coming back up, you know, to that. Because you got uncut wood fiber back here and you're trying to drive wedges, it makes it harder to, to lift and you don't know why. Because I can easily see that from here, but if that's uncut in there, you don't really know. And you can see there was a lot of pivoting around. So this matches up pretty well. This is Tim Hart, Forest Applications Training. Wishing you good sawing.